This fall, the presidential and congressional candidates will spend $1.6 billion on their campaigns, far and away an all-time high. Money in politics? Shocking. Have we gone too far? Joining us to discuss the matter are Ellen Miller, Executive Director of the Center for Responsive Politics, which tracks campaign spending. Tom Mann, Director of Governmental Studies at the Brookings Institution and co-author of Congress, the Press and the Public. Paul Hernson, Professor of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland and author of Congressional Elections, Campaigning at Home and in Washington. And Glenn Simpson, reporter for the Wall Street Journal and co-author of Dirty Little Secrets, The Persistence of Corruption in American Politics. The question before this house, is campaign spending out of control? This week on Think Tank. In recent weeks, reports of illegal Korean and Indonesian contributions to the Democratic National Committee have sparked new questions about campaign finances, both legal and illegal in both parties. In the wake of Watergate, Congress passed legislation in 1974 that limited the amount of money that citizens could give to political campaigns, $1,000 to each candidate and $5,000 to political action committees or PACs. But there was a loophole. Contributors, including corporations and unions, could give an unlimited amount of so-called soft money to the parties, not to the candidates. In addition, there's more money. Advocacy groups like the National Rifle Association can run ads supporting mostly Republican candidates. The AFL-CIO is spending $35 million in 1996, mostly to help Democratic candidates. Now, in theory, President Clinton and Senator Bob Dole have each been limited to a mere $62 million in public campaign money. But if you factor in all the hard money, the soft money, the PAC money, the independent expenditures, and so on and so on, it is estimated that the presidential election will cost almost $800 million in 1996. That's up from $311 million in 1992, well more than a doubling. Bob Dole has seized on this issue and has proposed campaign finance reform. We went through an experience in Watergate, our party. And after that happened, we thought we'd cleaned up politics and cleaned up campaign finance reform. But obviously that hasn't happened. There are a lot of abuses back in the 70s. Both parties got together and we produced campaign finance reform. But it's quite clear, based on what's happening here in recent days, that that we didn't go far enough. Critics say this attack is uh, somewhat hypocritical because both sides are guilty. If Bob Dole is virginal on this issue, it is retroactive virginity. Uh, let us uh, begin the questioning with uh, you, uh, Ellen Miller, and then let's go around the room. Is our election system out of control? Without question, the, the campaign finance system for our elections at all levels is out of control. There's more money that's being spent than ever before. You cited the number, $1.6 billion for all federal elections. It's coming from fewer people. Less than 1% of the American people make a contribution of $200 or more. And it's coming more from interested industries and interest groups. They have an ax to grind. And, you know, I think finally the other thing that's out of control is the ability to look at the, uh, the relationship between the campaign contributions and the decisions that come out of Congress or the White House uh, is all too easy to make. I mean, the, the uh, ability for contributors to cash in is likewise out of control. Paul Hernson, I would we, agree. Are, with, we, are we out of control? Uh, I would agree we are out of control to some degree. Um, there has been a breakdown of the regulatory regime that governs campaign finance, and as a result, the uh, campaign finance system is more loophole than law. Another problem is there's been a bifurcation of campaign politics. Candidates are now running one campaign for resources and another campaign for votes, and they're becoming very separate. And those that participate in the one campaign, that is the one for resources, are very different than those who participate in the campaign for votes. Tom Mann, what well, is the uh, view from the Brookings Institution at Noble Institute? I don't know about Brookings, but I can tell you I agree. I think the, the regulatory regime has collapsed. It's a joke. 
Uh, we have on the books uh, restrictions on size of contributions, but nowadays people in the parties and the White House, in the Congress, uh, if told someone is maxed out, they say, no problem, we can take care of that. That is, we can find a way to channel Ma your maxed dollars. Maxed out, explain Means that. Up to the limit of a contribution, say, an individual can make to a candidate uh, or to a political party, they say, we can channel, we can launder your dollars in ways to have unlimited contributions. That's what's building the cynicism right now. Politicians are shaking down individuals, companies, and, and unions to raise money in a, in a way that makes a joke of the whole regulatory regime. Glenn Simpson. Well, clearly the, the regime has disintegrated to, to the point where it doesn't really exist anymore and there is a sort of a loophole culture. Um, I think you do have to remember that at least part of the system clearly is working, which is that uh, people are still required to disclose the sources of much of this money and that's why we're having scandals right now because reporters can actually go and uh, look up where this money's coming from and if they're willing to do the investigation they can find out that some of it appears to come from Indonesia or from Spain or anything like that. So clearly this one shred of the system continues to work and maybe that's a little bit of a hint as to you know the recipe for fixing it. I, I wonder if any of you would like to comment on what Ellen said. I mean let, let us stipulate I think we all agree on that, that the system is out of control in terms of its regulatory function. It's yeah. just gone bananas. But Ellen says this is leading in effect to institutionalized corruption, that people, that this big money is buying things and in a sense it is unanswered because the people can't talk. But don't these various corporations, unions, institutions that pour this money in Aren't they also representing people? In other words, a corporation can employ 50,000 people, a union can have a half a million members, uh, a, a, uh, an, an independent expenditure, the National Rifle Association, whoever you want, they do represent memberships, they, they represent voters. Isn't this a market democracy, the money system? The, the problem is the inequalities that develop in a system like that, those economic interests that are best off, that those groups that are best organized are bound to to be more effective in a in a system of campaign finance such as the one we have. And the concern is that individuals not active in politics, not active in groups, tend to have their voice heard less. That's why we have political parties, presumably, and one of the one of the hopes for reformers, at least some reformers, is to build a bigger role for those groups that represent the individuals that are heard much less yeah, in I the also, process. I, I also think that, um, you know, ironically, Bob Dole said it best. He said there are no poor people's packs. I mean, there are no, uh, for, for, for general, uh, uh, the average citizen, there is no representation in a democracy that really has become, in essence, a cashocracy. It's clear you talk to any member of Congress. They will, they will say, any member will say, those who give get something more than just get good government. They get access to argue their case. And so the, if the vast majority of people can't afford to participate in this political system, then they really are, but in a practical sense, left on the sidelines. Spending for poor people in the last 30 years, say, has skyrocketed. I mean, defense has gone down, other things have gone down. Uh, 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 means-tested programs, so-called. I mean, that's how you measure uh, poor people. Thing have skyrocketed. Who, who, who bought it for well, them? I, I'm not sure that's a, that's uh, precisely true. Trust I me think, on that one. I think the right. uh, yeah. the. Okay. Uh, the real issue here is, you know, if we have a democracy that's based on how much cash you can give, and there is almost no one in this country who, who believes that the special interests who fund election campaigns don't get something in return that they in turn pay for. I just think we need to sort of be mindful of history here. I mean, the system has always rewarded those who are able to organize and accumulate cash behind their point of view. And I mean, you know, this is sort of a defining principle of politics is, you know, get organized, you know I mean? No, 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 but get organized is right, but, but get organized with money, I think that sort of strikes Getting organized, the, the definition uh, of getting yeah. organized no, is no, no, accumulating not, money. Money, you know, I think, I mean, in a democracy yeah. is not is not a good tool for political we're, participation. We're, we're a capitalist Catholic, you know, democracy, though, I mean, we've, we've and we've always had that. Right, we've always had money playing the, 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 the essence of our political system as money. I mean, that the courts have said, you know, money is speech.
Well, I, I think that, that flies in the face of what our founding uh, fathers had in mind in terms of political equality because money isn't evenly distributed in American society. I think organization is absolutely key, but organization written by how big a check you write, I think that's, that's highly questionable. I have a, a letter here addressed to dear friends, various lobbyists from one of the major political parties, uh, w which asks uh, for as this is a special fundraising drive, individual dinner tickets. $25,000 in non-federal funds, yeah. a table, and you get to be called a co-chair, $250,000 to buy a table before Election Day, and they say there has never been an undertaking of this size before. <laughs> they and say they, with pride. And they say, you can expect to hear from us soon. So we did you buy will. the table? What? Did, did you buy, buy the table? Buy, yeah, did I buy the table? Right. You, you betcha. No, but not only are you not buying a table, right. but, but there are people out there who are more than willing to buy the table. And you bet they get to have at their table, you know, a lawmaker, um, you know, a, a key staffer to uh, the candidate, whichever one this may be. Uh, to argue their case, to, to create the kind of subtle relationships that a Washington is so well known All for. Right. Uh, let's leave this for a moment and, and go back a, a little bit into history. Why was the 1974 post-Watergate law, the, the one that basically runs our system now, why was that established? It, it was designed to deal with the abuses in the 1972 election in which Maurice Stans, among others, were shaking down corporations for million-dollar contributions to help re-elect the president. It was seen as an outrageous flaunting of what was supposed to be limits on contributions from corporations and the like. So that's, I think that was the act, the set of behavior in 72 stimulated the law. Right now, in 1996, we have returned to how the system that but, was operating but, but at, in 72. at that time it could be done secretively? Right. Well, brown paper no bags disclosure. Were common. It, brown paper bags filled with cash were common. In other words, a corporation or a union or a, a private uh, a person could give a brown paper bag of cash to a candidate and it was never known. Well, well the problem was there was no disclosure. The, there was right. no Federal Election Commission. Right. There was there was no one to follow up and investigate on any of this. And, and that it was not illegal or it was no, illegal? No, it, it was, was illegal. illegal. It was illegal but there was no enforcement mechanism. Well, in the wake of Watergate, there were prosecutions of, of a lot of people. A lot of people ended up getting off, but, uh, but a number of people were prosecuted. I think uh, Armand Hammer uh, famously was prosecuted. And then ultimately got a pardon. That's right. <laughs> For which you made a large contribution. For which you made a large contribution. <laughs> yeah, but what's interesting is that, you know, Tom says the scandal is, is back at us again. I mean, the only difference now is that instead of brown paper bags full of cash going under the table at the White House, contributors are writing checks and they're being deposited openly. And, and But people like Glenn Simpson at the Wall Street Journal can now have a much easier time digging it out because it's all published. But you have I, to well, not as easy a time as he should have, right. but yes. Right. I, you know, I mean, that's what keeps me in business. But, but you have to ask yourself, you know, I mean, uh, are we ever going to get rid of this or are we just going to simply wish it away to the point where it is going to go back under the table and I'm not going to be able to find out about it and none of us are going to hear about it. it. You know, I mean, I would argue that this sort of thing is going to go on in a lot of ways. It's better to have it out in a transparent environment where I can write about it and Ellen Miller can scream about it and we can all sort of, you know, raise issues of what's proper and whether there's conflicts of interest. I, I don't think you can think that it's, it's just simply going to be wished away or bought away by, by dunning the taxpayers. No one disagrees with the importance of disclosure. The question is, is that all we can do? All, no, no holes barred, raise what money, extort what money you want. As long as you disclose it, and Glenn writes about it in the Wall Street Journal, we will, the public will decide on whether it's appropriate or not, and we'll all live happily is, is ever after. Is that your position? <laughs> uh, that is an a, a exaggeration, but essentially, essentially that's the nut of my position. I do feel Which that, is that people could give that that, that if I uh, if I wanted to give a million dollars or ten million dollars, no, uh, no. I could do that. No, I mean, I think didn't, that didn't Clement be. Stone give Nixon two million dollars right. in 1972 sure. dollars, which would be what about six sure. or seven million dollars? There should be broad. There should be limits, but they should be broad, and and we should encourage uh, a lot of activity similar to what we see today. It's just that 
um, you know, the politicians on one extreme and the reformers on the other are on the other, and there's there's sort of no compromising over sort of you know general broad limits that encourage freedom of activity. I mean, we have to remember political activity is First Amendment activity. You know, this is this is core national constitutional values we're talking about here, exercising the franchise of democracy, and you know we have to give people a fair amount of leeway to raise and spend money, which right. is but there are lots money. of people who really disagree. I think with the the constitutional decision that equates money with speech. I mean, Senator Bill Bradley's really said it best. He said, you know, the, the First Amendment uh, decision on this equates uh, a rich man's wallet with a poor man's soapbox. I mean, the First Amendment protects the free speech rights of the wealthy at the expense of the non-wealthy. I mean, I think when you talk about reform, let's throw it to the American public and see what they think, whether they'd like to have broad limits. Paul Hartson, can, can you give us some of this constitutional background on what, uh, there was an original case and now there's been a new case that the court uh, and the, the new court interpretation said that a political party can collect hard money and spend that money. What is hard money? Uh, right? Money within the federal system, right. subject to the, the limits set by the Federal Election Campaign Act, and then um, spend that money as if it were a PAC claiming to be independent. So a candidate uh, can be running a campaign in, in uh, Maine or Iowa or Illinois or somewhere and putting out a message, and then the political party can, on its own, make an independent expenditure that corresponds to that message. That's one ruling. Another ruling was about these issue advocacy campaigns, where it used to be parties could make generic pitches, um, uh, vote Republican for a change, it's morning in America, or those child ads, that the uh, children's ads the Democrats ran, um, which would have a general theme, but not mention a candidate by name. Now the parties can put on ads that mention candidates by names so long as they don't say elect or defeat or some other key word that... Uh, so they can say Congressman Jones is a jerk and he votes against children. Exactly. And they can also say Challenger Smith is a wonderful fellow and he supports children and they can list one as a Democrat and one as a Republican but they, the only thing they can't say having uh, made a hero of one of them and a villain of the other is who to vote for. That's right. That's right. That's a major change. That's why the whole system has really become a joke mm -hmm. now. Uh, I too believe individuals and groups ought to have the right to raise and spend money and actively participate in the in the political process, but we've set with the help of the court this artificial line between political or hard money spending and non-political or issue advocacy and it's a joke and the latter is overwhelming the former. What I'd like to do is free up the political parties to spend as much money as they want on behalf of their candidates um, but require that the money they get, all of the money they get, come under the restrictions of federal election law. That is to say federalize the system by eliminating all soft money. You can raise the limits if you want to have individuals give a little bit more to the party but then free up the parties to do what they want well, to. Well, the but they'll, idea, they'll be freed yeah. up, but they won't have any money. Well, yes, they can raise money. Uh, I mean, right they, now, if, individuals if a can give, what, $20,000? Right. Individuals can give $20,000 a year to a national political party. That's not chump change. They mm -hmm. can raise money. The amount, of, the amount of soft money from 1992 to 1996 these are the estimates from your group, uh, Ellen, went from $83 million to $240 million right. in one cycle, yeah, from 92 right. to 96. Yeah, right. That is a tripling. Right. Yes. Which is why... It's up to a quarter right. of a trillion dollars right. in soft money. Which is why we need to about. sort of... I think Tom's got the right idea. We, we need to sort of stop wishing for a perfect system and find a responsible and reasonable proposal that will, will give parties and uh, it will give all this fundraising energy a place to vent itself, but will you know put it within some reasonable limits. Because otherwise, I mean, if we keep fighting for a perfect solution, you know, the system is going to just continue to disintegrate and explode. I think we also have to remember, Ellen, that you know, it has always been the case that the wealthy have been the most politically active, and most you know ordinary folks. I mean, you know. You couldn't persuade me to give fifty dollars to a candidate, not to mention a thousand. You know, most people I know are just like me. You know, uh, that's always been the case. Well, part of the the problem is, as you pointed out earlier, with those figures, there's a lot of money out there, and that money will find its way into the system, really, no matter what we do. If we pass reform that limits uh, people to giving twenty thousand dollars in hard or soft money 
to the uh, parties and federalize it, we still have all these state elections. And the money will flow into those state elections with the goal of turning out um, Democrats or Republicans, depending on who the money goes to. Another key point is that um, with all of this money uh, flowing in, it usually flows to either competitive races because someone wants to have an impact on the outcome or even more often to incumbents. And we end up with a real problem with the distribution of money in campaigns. You've got really safe incumbents in very powerful positions, committee chairs or ranking members, um, raising in the millions in the typical House race, and then a challenger on the other side with maybe 50000 or 150000 or $200,000. And the incumbent is well known and has got lots of support and a real good political machine in the district, and the challenger is invisible, and well, it makes I, for an uncompetitive I, contest. You know, I mean, the problem with that is it seems like that's the case, but then how do you explain the intense competition right now in our system? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, right now we're going into a congressional election, we were just talking about this, you know, where there's an amazing number of incredibly competitive races. And, and, no, and no, I mean, here, here we're all well, sitting around, that money is washing, and nobody knows who's going to win the Congress. Well, exactly. that's why there's so much money flowing in, because there are these 140 House races yes, that are right. really races, up for grabs, and the control of the House and, and the Senate are up for grabs, so everybody's pouring right. money in. And that, these that, races are more financially competitive today than well, they have been in yeah, the past. I mean, that's I, why let me make just one point. If I might, let's go around the room once to, uh, to finish this up, again starting with you, Ellen. And I am going to appoint each of you president. I'm going to give you two terms. I'm going to give you a sympathetic Congress, a sympathetic Supreme Court. You are going to control all the state legislatures. You are a democratic dictator. Congratulations, Madam President. <laughs> you have 45 seconds maximum to tell me what you would do. Um, I think uh, I would uh, send a bill to the Congress. Uh, that prohibited uh, the private financing of congressional and presidential elections in the primary and general election period. I would do that because I would say, let's look at the problems we have today of the influence of private money, how it screens candidates, how it, it pulls on legislators after election day, how it means that accountability is granted to those who give nice. big money. So you are for total public financing of elections? I believe it's the only way to create a distance between the elected officials and the cash constituents who fund their election campaign. President Hernson. Well, I would um, begin from the assumption that no matter what I did, private funding would find its way into politics because this is a capitalistic democracy. That's the backdrop of our elections. I would recognize the major problem to be a lack of competition in a lot of uh, House races, Senate races, and even state and local races, although I couldn't deal with that. So I would remind the voters and the Congress that the federal, that the airwaves, that TV and radio broadcast to, um, over belong to us, and I would require all these stations to give media time to candidates. I would also require uh, the post office through the Treasury to give free mailings to candidates, and I would try to equalize the gap between challengers and incumbents and rich candidates and poor candidates. I would still allow for some private funding, but with strict disclosure and strict limits. Mr. President. I'd allow private funds to continue to play a role in our politics, but I would eliminate all soft money by federalizing the system, but free up the parties to spend their hard dollars in any way they want. I would also commandeer the airwaves some way and give blocks of time to the parties to allocate among among their candidates so that we could actually get the messages of challengers as well as uh, incumbents out. And thirdly, I would, I would deal with this joke of a distinction between issue advocacy and electoral uh, campaigning and ensure that groups outside that engage in election advertising are subject to the same restrictions on funding as federal candidates are. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Please give my regards to the First Lady. Uh, <laughs> Mr. President, uh, Glenn Simpson, you've had to leave the Wall Street Journal in order to take it to move right. into 1600 right. Pennsylvania Avenue, but right. you got it. The first thing we do is we give journalists subpoena power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Then uh, <laughs> we declare the four-day work Impeachment. week. Impeachment! Right, right. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I, I, we declare a grand compromise, which is we say to all the unregulated players who are proliferating so quickly, come back inside the system and we will loosen the rules so that we can all um, uh, get along inside of the system. We will give you um, the freedom to raise uh, large amounts of money and to make reasonably large amounts of campaign contributions, but you have to disclose it, you have to acknowledge the fact that you are indeed a political player, i.e. Christian coalition or organized labor. Um, and that you know, would be the basic 
framework for what I do. And I, I, I would, uh, notwithstanding my joke, uh, in, increase uh, disclosure, make it more possible for people to find out what is going on. I, you know, some sort of reasonable limits would be a good idea, but broad enough that we could all have freedom of movement. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ellen Miller, Tom Mann, Paul Hernson, and Glenn Simpson, and thank you. Come visit the new location of our website at www.pbs.org, or as usual, you can reach us at New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.